I would now invite the Honorable Judith Collins to speak. A lawyer by trade and training and a minister of many portfolios over a 13-year career in Parliament, Judith Collins represents the Papa Curate electorate here in Auckland. Please join me in welcoming Judith to the podium. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge a few people first. Um, the Right Honourable Dame Sean Lice. Um, Dame Sean and I have known each other for many years, and um, she's always, when I heard she was going to be here tonight, I had to be here. Uh, can I acknowledge Dr. Lindsay Diggleman? Um, great to hear you, Lindsay. Dr. Stephen Winter and Dr. Jennifer Lees Marsh, and all of those who are doctors and aren't doctors in the audience. And um, thanks for being here. So, good law takes time, sort of like a cheese, really. Sometimes it takes several attempts to get it right, and then as any Minister of the Crown who has carefully shepherded major law changes through first Cabinet and secondly through the New Zealand Parliament in the MMP era, the first thing to start planning after implementation are the amendments, and the Magna Carta is no exception. The Magna Carta is one of the most quoted and occasionally misused sources of New Zealand's flexible constitutional arrangements. Recently, in one of those rare shows of unity normally reserved for New Zealand tragedies or more happily for sporting achievements, Parliament debated a notice of motion celebrating the 800th anniversary of the first Magna Carta of 1215. The efforts ranged from the witty and the informed to the Wikipedia version, I don't know what we used to do without that, and finally to the Dennis Denuto interpretation from the excellent Australian movie, The Castle. That saw the effort of the Magna Carta being described as uh, the vibe. There was even some suggestion that one member of parliament who shall remain nameless could, should in fact be able to speak on the matter having been there at the signing. <laughs> But that would be unfair to the Right Honourable Winston Peters. And, um, <laughs> and of course, I don't think we should be unfair. <laughs> Some of the contributions were actually a bit embarrassing. But to be frank, it's probably the first time that the Magna Carta has had such an airing in Parliament since 100 years ago in 1915. The Magna Carta of 1215 didn't last long. It was annulled by Pope Innocent III. Imagine that happening today. Perhaps the modern equivalent would be the European Parliament or the European Court of Justice declaring a UK law annulled. That would be enough to get a referendum in the UK to leave the European Union. Oh, yes, that's right, it happened just like that just recently. The annulment led to another Barons' War, and the Magna Carta was reissued later in 2016. It was reissued again, uh, 1225, and finally confirmed as part of English statute law in 1297. We've heard from Lindsay that it is now section 29 of the 1297 version of the Magna Carta that's still in force in New Zealand. Putting it into today's language, it, that particular section has been taken to mean that there shall be no imprisonment, no taking of land or rights, no outlawing, no denying or deferring of the right of justice, without first a lawful judgment of the court. It doesn't mean that a specific law applies equally to all. What it does mean is that all are entitled to the protection of the law and the exercise of that protection. It means that all are subject to the law, not necessarily every single law. The rule of law in its most basic form is a principle that no one is above the law. No one, including the sovereign or the crown, can ignore the law. I've been asked to consider the Magna Carta from my experience as a Minister of the Crown and it might be useful to be able to consider it also as a Member of Parliament. In doing so, I am going to briefly consider our New Zealand constitutional arrangements to provide some context. When we consider the modern day application of the Magna Carta, it is unhelpful to try to substitute the 1215 King John for Her Majesty the Queen, or even for the Prime Minister John. The Barons could possibly be the Cabinet, but really, the exercise of the Cabinet on behalf of the Crown sits the Cabinet more firmly with the Crown. After all, Cabinet Ministers are Ministers of the Crown. No, as representatives of all the people of New Zealand, perhaps it is Parliament that is more akin to the Barons of 1215. 
Our parliament, as a unicameral parliament, is comprised of the House of Representatives. When our forebears voted out the concept of an upper house, they voted out the concept of a House of Lords or those who had particular leadership by birth or by political convention or even political donations. All New Zealand members of parliament are equal. Every vote counts the same. The Prime Minister's vote has the same standing as that of the Leader of the Opposition or any other member of Parliament. So when New Zealand laws are passed, they have to be passed by the House of Representatives. And unlike the Barons of 1215, if the people don't agree with us, then every three years they get to decide if they still want us representing them. Recently I read an opinion piece from an academic that asked whether the law change to casino gambling to allow Sky City to have more pokey machines could be in keeping with the Magna Carta. Relatively certain they weren't thinking about it back in 1215. But I'd also say the question was asked, was that equality before the law? In other words, was the law change consistent with the rule of law? I thought it a rather spurious argument. For example, the law can take into account the special needs, rights or obligations of people in industry or by age. Police officers, for example, are legally entitled to carry firearms in airports. I don't suggest any of you decide that you want to have that same right too, unless you are a sworn police officer. Alcohol cannot be served and sold sorry, to those under 18 years of age, but can to those 18 and over. The Treaty of Waitangi forms part of our constitutional arrangements. Certain customary rights to fishing are retained by Māori solely. It is not equality of the law, but it is accepted by the law. New Zealand ministers of the Crown, unlike their US counterparts, are all members of Parliament, and therefore have a dual role of representing both the people as members of Parliament and the Crown as ministers of the Crown. If we consider the US Constitution was developed during the time of King George III, it's clear to see that the President gained the executive powers of the then King, George III. The Senate, those of the House of Lords, and the US House of Representatives, those of the then UK House of Representatives. As our New Zealand experience of self-government and democracy came considerably later than the US example, our constitutional arrangements reflect constitutional monarchy rather than that of a monarchy or a presidency with executive powers. So, for instance, the US president exercises the power of veto, as it was exercised by the 18th century King George III, while the New Zealand Prime Minister votes in Parliament and has no power of veto. The Governor-General, representing Her Majesty the Queen, retains that right but doesn't exercise it, respecting at all times the will of the people. Having been a senior minister of the Crown for six years, I can assure you that Cabinet does not consider the exact wording of the Magna Carta. Not once. Parliament doesn't either. They do, however, consider the principles of the Magna Carta, especially as they are provided for in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, 1990. Every proposed law is considered by my former ministry, the Ministry of Justice, which considers the proposed law against the Bill of Rights Act 1990. The Bill of Rights Act, known as BORA, is very much part of the discussions both in Parliament and in Cabinet. It does not have the status of supreme law and it cannot be used by the courts to overturn the supremacy of Parliament, but it can be used to promote better law. It is, in fact, the conscience of both Ministers of the Crown and of Parliament. Provisions of Bora reflect the very early rendition in 1215 and later 1279. The right against unreasonable search or seizure, the right not to be arbitrarily detained in sections 21 and 22 of the Bill of Rights Act reflect clause 29 of the Magna Carta. The right to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial court is also provided for in both the Bill of Rights Act and the Magna Carta. Section 7 of the Bill of Rights Act requires the, Governor, the Attorney General to draw to the attention of Parliament any bill that is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights Act. This is taken very seriously by both the Crown and by Parliament. It is not a finding that one takes lightly to have one's bill 
uh, alerted to the uh, parliament in that way. New Zealand has been without serious social discourse since the last of the New Zealand land wars at the end of the 19th century. Even times such as the 1951 waterfront strike or the 1981 Springbok tour have not led to a breakdown in society or the rule of law. The rule of law and the need to comply with the law as exercised by the majority of people keeps New Zealand free of major social discord. The Magna Carta is just one of a number of constitutional laws, principles and conventions that comprise our uniquely New Zealand constitution. Our laws belong not to government or to the courts but to the people. Laws are no more static than the lives of New Zealanders. What was once thought etched in stone, such as marriage between a man and a woman, or even a papal veto of law, can be thrown aside at the will of the people. New Zealand law is based on the principles of the rule of law, the sovereignty of parliament in representing the people, and the separation of powers. Our constitutional experience does not always travel well to other countries, any more than theirs travels well to ours. Our history is different, our future is different, but we can be very assured that the principle of the rule of law, as seen in the Magna Carta, will continue to be as important into the future as it has been for 800 years. Thank you.